Okay, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I told myself I have to get this video out of the way so that it doesn't continue becoming like my entire personality. Even if I know in my heart that I will never let this go. Hello everyone, my name is Fifi and welcome to my channel. Today, we are going to be doing something very, very, very exciting. This is my third attempt to film this video. The first time, it didn't work out because of lighting. The second time, it just didn't work out. And now, third time, third time's a charm. I think we're finally, we're sticking with this. As you have seen from the title of this video, I am going to be talking about the Grishaverse books by Miss Leigh Bardugo herself. Yes, I have finally finished all Leigh Bardugo books. We don't know if she's gonna come out with more after Rule of Wolves. I'm going to be ranking the books from my most favorite to my least favorite, but also I'm going to be talking about all of them each and how I'm going to be doing that so as to make this as cohesive as possible. I am going to talk about what I liked and did not like about each book. So it's like a pros and cons. All of this is just based on what I felt when I read the books. I've already read most of them more than once. Yeah, I've already reflected, I've ruminated, the feelings have been marinated, we've gone through different reviews, and now I think I finally have some final thoughts. And before we dive, I just want to say that this video will be very, very, very biased. I have a love-hate toxic relationship with Miss Lee Bardugo. I allow her to love me tender and make me happy at the same time, disappoint me and put salt in my wounds and just hurt me. It's an active choice. Uh, we, it, I just choose to allow her to do it. <laughs> and you know, here we are. Let's just go. Cause we're gonna be here a while. By the way, if you have any like contentious arguments um, about what I am about to say, by all means, put them in the comments, but please be respectful. Um, all of these are my opinions. You can think otherwise. You are allowed to voice out your thoughts and discuss with me. Um, I am open to discourse. There will be spoilers, a lot of spoilers. So if you don't want that, leave. I will be seeing you some other time and we're just gonna dive. If you just want to see my ranking, by all means, skip to the end. Here's the timestamp. This is going to be a very, very, very long video, so sit back, relax, and if you're planning to stay here for a while, um, get your coffee, get your tea, uh, snuggle under the covers because we're gonna talk about so many things. Okay, so of course we will start with the number one, Shadow and Bone. Okay, so what did I like about this book? Not a lot, not a lot, but <laughs> I would say I love the universe. This whole world that Lee Bardugo built with the Grisha, um, with the different countries, with her characters is very very interesting. I would have loved, this is already going to my dislikes but it ha has to be said now, I would have loved more world building. I read Six of Crows before I read this and I, the only reason why I picked this up is to relate to the show and know what the show is about but I have to say it's an okay book. I didn't hate it I didn't love it either. It's in a gray area. I don't really care about the characters at all. The writing I found too fast. Um, I feel like I was looking through a series of montages and just flipping through um, a summary book. But I feel like if I read this when I were younger, maybe in, in high school, I would have been all for it. I would have been down. I did read Six of Crows first, so I had expectations as to how the writing would have gone, didn't see it here. I was expecting to be introduced to the Garisha in a formal way because in Six of Crows it was just kind of, you know, in passing because the story wasn't really about Grisha. Whereas in this book, it's all about the Grisha, it's all about finding our main character Alina Starkov, realizing she has powers and is a one-of-a-kind Grisha. She's the Sun Summoner. I didn't need the whole like encyclopedia of which Grisha 
had witch power. There's this um, thing at the start of every book, a list of all the classes of Grisha, but you don't really see what they can do fully. And if it was never really emphasized in the books. I was expecting like a whole inauguration to the Grishaverse. I love Genya. Genya is my favorite character in this <laughs> in this entire book. Again, I didn't really care much about the other characters. Alina was okay. The Darkling, he was attractive, you know, in a dark way, but again, not much characterization. Mal off the bat, sorry, I he was not my type. Also, Mal's letter in the last part, I found really annoying. It's so long, and I was like, dude, this is not there. It, this was useless. So, was not for that. That's Shadow and Bone. Let's go to Siege and Storm. We're gonna talk about a lot of things because a lot happened in this book, and um, safe to say, it's my favorite book out of the three. Okay. What did we like about Siege and Storm? First, the pacing. Pacing was finally there. The writing kicked off, man. It's so different from Shadow and Bone where it was just like, we were breezing through, but at the same time, like what was happening? This one finally had rhythm. We were dancing. Things were getting spicy. The conflict was thickening and Alina, my girl Elena was finally getting some agency, you know? She was finally getting confused with what she wanted. She wasn't all about Mal anymore. Unlike the first book, all she was thinking about was Mal, 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 writing to Mal, blah, 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 Mal, 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 Mal. We were not for that sister. Now, she finally is, you know, starting to realize that there is a whole other side to her and a bigger world out there in front of her. I love that for you, bestie. Yes, we want growth. Which is the second thing I like about this book. Alina. It's so funny because many people I see really hated Alina in this book. Um, and just hates Alina in general and does not like her whiny personality or how she can't make decisions. And I respect that. I know she can be annoying. She's a teenager. But I really saw <laughs> myself in the, the bad decisions she was making. She was being seduced by her power, by the Darkling. But again, she finally has more to hold on to other than Mal. You got me. You got me. Yes, I don't like Mal. If you're a Mal fan, please exit this video because you will hate me and I don't want you to hate me. I want this relationship to be good, I want us to respect each other, and I want you to know that if you like Mal or love him, I respect you. I just don't think the same way. We see Alina in Siege and Storm wanting more power, loving her light. She discovers that there are two more amplifiers and she wants them for herself. There's this whole wonky part of Malina, page 386, I tapped it. But this is the part where Alina finds out that Mal has been fighting underground and then she discovers Zoya kissing him and she runs away and Mal runs after her, yada 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 yada, they have a fight. I can't ever just be Alina again. That girl is gone. I want her back, he said roughly. I can't go back, I screamed, not caring who heard me. Even if you take away this collar and the sea whipped scales, you can't carve this power out of me. And what if I could? Would you let it go? Would you give it up? Never. Never. Yes, girl. Tell him. You tell him you want your light. You tell him this is where you belong. This is you. This is the real you. We see a main character who is now layered and complex who wants things that she knows she shouldn't have, like more power, more amplifiers, but yes, she still wants them. And we love that. We love layers. We love complexity. We love conflict of the mind, of the soul, darkness and light, you know, kind of battling together. We love it. We love to see it. Alina was finally being self-centered. Yes, want things for yourself. Not for your best friend, for yourself. God, I'm so getting canceled for this video. Especially my third thing that I loved, the Darkling. The Darkling. What? 
Bro, what are you talking about, man? Fifi loves the dark lane. It's time to exit. It's time to move on to a different booktuber. Let me explain. Was I drawn to the dark lane? Yes. But is he a complete psycho? Yes! The whole equals arc really intrigued me in a way that you see these two opposite characters, Alina and the Darkling, feel the same way. They both feel like outcasts, they never belong anywhere, they are two of the most powerful summoners, and they're only the two of their kind. I understood why they were so drawn to each other in that way. Their draw to power brings them together. They both are seeking belonging and acceptance in a society that kind of shuns them, but also at the same time worships them, which kind of, you see that that's where the greed stems from, for more power and more control over things around them. It's just delicious conflict, dudes. It's tension was so sexy, but at the same time, you know, you were conflicting because this dude is a psycho and you don't want your main girl to be like, to succumb to darkness. But you can't deny that she is all about it. You know, she's in her head. She wants the other fetter, all three amplifiers together. We love that there was this whole anti-heroine stuff going on because I personally think there's not enough anti-hero arcs in fiction. Or maybe I just don't know where to look. Uh, but I loved seeing that here. The Alina corruption arc, honestly, was something I was very open to because it made sense. You know, it made sense with her background, what she went through, um, her unrequited love for Mal, you know, not belonging anywhere. I knew it wasn't going to happen, but it made... She's a teenage girl, you know, she's allowed to have her options um, and look elsewhere, the way Mal was also looking elsewhere. I just don't like the whole discussion in the fandom, personally. I'm not attacking anybody again. Please don't send hate. But I just don't like how people didn't agree or like hated on Alina because she was suddenly entertaining thoughts about the Darkling, about Nikolai, who we meet in this book. Another thing that I love about Siege and Storm. Yeah, I just didn't like that people didn't respect her for entertaining thoughts about a different person when Mal, you know, was all up there with different people. So, double standards, am I right? Also, there was this post on Tumblr that I saw that, of course, this was a Dark Lena stan. She or he said, Dark Lena could be a um, wrong time, right people kind of soulmate trope. And I like that. I like that analysis that maybe if, if Alina came into the Dark Link's life, 300 years earlier could have coaxed him out of you know his little vengeance agenda and his anger um, but the dude is 500 plus years old and he's just living inside this bubble of hatred and pent up anger so there's really nothing homegirl could have done but i like that i love that post i'll link it down below to dark lena stands if you're not a dark lena don't check it out um but yeah it was good Last thing I loved about Siege and Storm, which I think should be the only thing we should talk about, the tailor, Jenyeon Safin, again. She is my favorite character in this trilogy. The writing for the tailor was exquisite. Where was this in Shadow and Bone is just what I've I'm just curious. Oh, I forgot to mention the side characters. Of course, we were introduced to Nikolai, the best man. In this trilogy, he is just everything we want. Charming and narcissistic and a prince. We love the twins, Tolia and Tamar. Of course, we were back with Nadia and Marie and Fedior and all the other Grisha and the Little Palace. The classic Lee Bardugo banter finally kicked off in this book. Now, let's talk about what we didn't like. Namely, number one, Maliana Retsev. I just realized the Mal is a type. He's the best friend, boy next door, charming type. Um, and he was not my type. When I was reading Siege and Storm, I was cursing him. I wanted him gone. I wanted Alina to end up with a Darkling instead because I was against this Mal agenda. But then Nikolai came into the picture and I was like, oh my God, who? This is a love square. Where are we going? In this book, he really made questionable choices. He was insecure, he was infuriating, he was annoying. And if you're a mouse dad and you don't agree with me, please reevaluate, because he really was annoying in this book. 
don't come at me. But of course the common argument to throw back at Mal haters is Mal was 17, he's a teenager, and like Alina who made questionable choices, he's also allowed to make questionable choices um, and also allowed to become jealous and petty and insecure and okay, I see your point, but personally, me putting myself in Alina's shoes, seeing this through her head. I just couldn't stomach the fact that this boy that I've loved my whole life wants me to lose my powers, see me back in square one when I was weak and mousy, not my words, Lee Bardugo's words, frail and dependent, just so he can grasp me. You know what I'm saying? Just so he can pocket me and go back to being commoners and living in a farm. I mean, yeah, okay, you risk your life for me, you looked for the stag and the sea whip, you almost died for me, but you also want an old version of me instead of the person that I am becoming. Any plot where a woman has to, or anybody, you know, not just a woman, has to shrink themselves into an image of what their partner wants them to be is a no for me. At the same time though, I don't want to discredit the fact that Alina also had her faults because, you know, it takes two to tango and all that. There's this really beautiful um, sentence that she said in page 386. Mal was miserable here. He'd been suffering since the moment we arrived, but I have refused to see it. I'd railed at him for wanting me to be something I couldn't, and all the while, I demanded the same thing from him. So they both were expecting differently of each other. They weren't the same person as they used to be anymore. I love that they discovered this about each other, and I love that Alina acknowledged that she was also at fault. Although, personally, I thought that this already, this scene, was a testament to why they shouldn't end up together. They just had different priorities at the time, and I don't know, it was just like, it, it wasn't working. But I think a big part of why Alina suddenly grew hungry with power, aside from the Darkling, of course, encouraging her and seducing her to it, is because everyone around her is just trying to kill her, use her, suppress her. It just stemmed from there, and she just craved for something that she couldn't have, because it's always... She's always given things she couldn't have. At first it was Mal, it was unrequited. And then suddenly she has her sunlight that she couldn't own to the maximum level because the Darkling wants to control her. Mal wants it gone. Nikolai wants to use it for, you know, as a symbol of hope for Ravka. So everyone is just trying to use Alina. I don't know. It, I'm just, I feel sorry for our main girl. Oh no, it is starting to rain. If you're hearing rain, I'm so sorry. I <sighs> Also, my dog is here. Say hi, Kiev. Say hi to the camera. Hi, everyone. I'm here to wreck havoc. Let's go to the book that is called Ruin and Rising. And it did a whole lot of ruining and no rising if I'm being completely honest. Safe to say I hated this book. I hated the ending. The first part was okay, but I think everything just amounted to that anticlimactic and disappointing ending. And I know not everyone will agree with me because many fans loved how the trilogy ended, but let's just talk about what happened. There were things I loved about this book, actually quite a lot. First, at the start of the book, especially like in the first chapters, um, we see that Alina was underground and trapped with the Apparat and all Sun Saint worshippers. And I love this whole living saint theme because as someone who is very uh, attuned to her faith, I practice religiously. I have a grasp of how powerful faith is. But then in this book, um, you see Alina who is a living martyr but is miserable. It reminded me so much of this Filipino musical um, and movie, classic Filipino movie played by a really famous Filipino actress, Nora Honor. Um, this movie is called Himala. It was also uh, made into a musical in 2019, 2018, played by the wonderful Isil Santos. So if you haven't, if you don't know about it, check it out. So it is about a girl called Elsa who suddenly has a vision of the Virgin Mary and what is supposedly a miracle turns into kind of mass hysteria 
in her town, which is kind of suffering through poverty and a lot of uh, sickness. So she's put on a pedestal, she's worshipped, but she's miserable. And there are so many expectations kind of laid on her. And I see that in Ruin and Rising. We see Ravka, who was war-torn and bankrupt, relying on this teenage girl to save them all. And it's such a kind of harrowing theme to have, um, to see faith in this light. The whole saints theme in the Grisha verse is kind of a, a grim concept in general because we see these sats and sanctas being martyred. Like Saint Ilya, he was chained and drowned. Um, Saint Grigory was fed to the bears. And then Saint Felix was, I think, roasted. And not like verbally roasted, like set on fire roasted on a stick. So yeah, there. It's a grim theme, but very, very, very interesting nonetheless. I really enjoyed that part. And of course, the second thing we loved about Ruin and Rising, or the whole Grisha trilogy in general, is the man, the myth, the legend, the Darkling. Such a good villain and probably one of the best villains I've ever read. Bold statement, but so is this line. The Darkling gently folded me in his arms. He pressed a kiss to the top of my hair. I will strip away all that you know, all that you love, until you have no shelter but mine. Hello? A lunatic. This guy is crazy, he's a psychopath, he's a tyrant. There's nothing like a good villain who truly, truly believes in his or her cause. He kind of reminds me of Thanos in a way from the Avengers. Again, I'm basic so I love the Avengers. But this man truly believes that sacrificing a few hundred people will save his race and the destruction that he conceives will be good for Ravka. He's tired of seeking acceptance. He's been doing this for five centuries, bowing down to kings who fail him. And now he wants people to bow to him. He was like, these lands of kings cannot I am the only one who can restore order and bring respect to my race. Good for him he knows what he wants, good for him that he has an agenda, but bad for everyone else because he has five centuries of pent-up rage and vengeance and just anger. Magnificent villain, magnificent line. That line was one of the best lines ever. And another thing that we loved, which is related to the Darkling, was the novella at the end of Ruin and Rising, which was Demon in the Wood. Wow, wow, wow. That humanized him so much more and gave you an understanding of where his anger is coming from. And we only got to see like one event in his life that kind of led up to what he could have possibly gone through, you know, living as the Darkling growing up. He realized that nobody can hurt him unless he allows them to and he didn't allow them to for the next 500 years. And I love that for him. He's terrible. <laughs> Do we want him dead? Yes. Do we want him underground? Yes. But is he a brilliant villain? Yes. If anybody needs a break, um, pause this video, go to the bathroom or get your snacks because we're going to the rough part. It will be the things I didn't like and there are many, many, many things I didn't like. And yeah, so if you need a bathroom break, pause this right now. If you want to keep going, let's go because there are many things to talk about. And again, we are going to start with Malian or Ratsav. The most consistent thing I had going on in this trilogy is me not liking Mal, and I love that for me. So I mentioned in Siege and Storm that Mal is kind of the asshole poster boy, and he changes in Ruin and Rising, and we th that's good for him, that he had some kind of character development or spring awakening, whatever. But do you like this change? I didn't. Because from asshole poster boy, he now becomes soft boy poster boy, which is probably much worse. Another consistent thing that Mal had going on from start to finish was make Alina feel guilty for everything that she did. For having her powers, being a powerful woman. Now he is repenting for his sins, but now he's making her feel guilty for not choosing him and for like being mad at him and all that. And he has all these lines that are like, Deserve her! I don't deserve you and you're too good for me and blah 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 we're not equals and I'm just like 
boy. This is not about you. This is about my homegirl, Lena. So stop giving her conflicting feelings because she's gonna, she's a simp for you and she's gonna give in. I don't want her to give in. There's not much to say about this book, honestly, in terms of like plot because we actually just end up with the most anticlimactic climax ever, which is Mal being the third amplifier. Yay, surprise. Mal's an important character after all, and he's a Morisova. And that was revealed in the most um, underwhelming way. I don't know, that whole scene where they find the Firebird, Alina and Mal, and then Alina kind of falls off a, like a cliff, and then Mal holds her wrist, and then suddenly she feels like a surge of power. Um, and then they just conclude he's the amplifier. Like they just they just conclude like there was There was a... and then after that reveal we just conclude that Mal is a Morisova No fact-checking no research and I know like there's no paternity tests or anything in the Grisha verse And I know this is a fantasy and I'm all for the impossible Becoming possible, but this just did not make any sense, it was anticlimactic, and maybe my feelings are stemming from the fact that I didn't like Mal in the first place. The <sighs> boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Again, this is just my opinion. If you loved it, you do you, sister. Good for you that you enjoyed this. I would have loved to enjoy this the way you did. Also, Mal and Alina had sex. You do you if you love that, but did I? Anyway, let's go to the ending. Alina stabs Mal. She loses her powers, suddenly spawning a couple hundred other sun summoners, which is, I guess, cool. And then she stabs the Darkling. The Darkling dies. And then Mal, who is supposedly dead, comes back to life. Why? I hated the epilogue. They get married? What? Like, okay, they rebuild Karamzin. Cool. But then, you see a scene of Alina reaching out to the window like this and trying to, like, get caressed by the sunlight. And it just makes you angry and gives you pain. Why? Because homegirl did not deserve to lose her powers. It's like you lend her her Grisha powers and then you proceed to put the weight of the world on her shoulders, had three books where she wanted to love her powers but she actually couldn't because people are trying again to use her, suppress her, or kill her. Then you take her powers away and in return for what? A husband? We even see a possible corruption arc. But then we end up with her powerless and married. Feminism is dead, am I right? You know what, this goes to show that Mal is actually the main character of the series because he gets everything he wants. He's actually the third amplifier. He has some sort of character development from being super like an asshole to being repentant. Sacrificed himself, but then lived. Oh, we forgot to mention, he got the girl. Got the girl hitched. Chained, chained to him, baby. Alina is powerless and what did Mal want from the very beginning? Alina back to her old self. So there. There we go. It was a whole mal trip. There was this one discussion that stood out to me, and I think this has been discussed over a lot of times in the Grishaverse fandom, where it was a form of punishment for her, mainly because she tried to kind of meddle with something that was unnatural. She was trying to gain power that was not for one person. And it's always repeated in the book, that what is infinite is the universe and the greed of men. So, you know, those three amplifiers together kind of symbolized something that was too much for one person. However, I do disagree with certain parts of this argument. I understand that she had to break from her amplifiers to break off her bondage with the Darkling and the fetters and all that. The power of the sun had to be distributed. I also see why that had to happen, but and I'm going to make a quick jump to Rule of Wolves. Um, if you don't want to hear a spoiler, if you haven't read it, um, I'm just going to say a spoiler right here. We see Zoya in Rule of Wolves acquire something so powerful, the scales of a saint, and she transforms into a dragon. She becomes the Grisha who can control all elements. She is corporalki, etherealki, and materialki all at once. And that is extreme power. And I just don't understand, if you have someone like Zoya who can possess that abundance of power, why can't you have Alina 
or leave Alina with, you know, s some of her power. She did not deserve to be stripped away of all of it, of all of her life. There was nothing left in her. And I know those are two different circumstances. Zoya um, obtained her scales in a different way. Alina obtained it in a different way. Taking away her power entirely again? Homegirl didn't deserve this. Homegirl didn't deserve punishment. Maybe I'm just bitter, you know? I'm just bitter because Alina's characterization was very inconsistent. Like, she wants one thing, and then suddenly you she ends up with another, and we're supposed to believe that this is actually all she wanted all along. We know she loves Karim Zinn with all her heart, but, you know, do you really expect me to believe that this is the future she wanted, that she wanted to get married ASAP. And honestly, if Lee really wanted um, Alina to end up with Mal, she could have just made it an open-ended conclusion where Alina and Mal choose to choose themselves first and, you know, go maybe go different paths or maybe not get together, not get married all of a sudden. Like, what is the rush, man? Why? You know, it would have been, oh god, there are so many what could have been and just not this. This ending really broke my heart, especially since I was loving Alina and I was learning to respect her, but then suddenly you give her this ending. It really pissed me off that Lee had to write her, you know, reaching out towards the sunlight at the end. <sighs> There! There we go. Oh my god, that was a trilogy. We've been here so long. I hope you're still here. Now I'm just going to light a candle to the Alina Starkov that we lost. Um, rest in peace to Alina Starkov and her powers. She deserved more and she will always deserve more. And I would like to thank my beautiful friend Julia for getting me this candle from the cottage candles. This is not a sponsored video, but we're done with the Shadow and Bone Trilogy. Let us go to the Six of Crows duology, AKA Miss Bardugo's best work. I'm not gonna be touching much on two books. Actually, I have barely anything to say because I've already said what I had to say in this video. So if you wanna see me cry and break down over Six of Crows and the characters, and of course, Crooked Kingdom, please just check out this video after watching this one. I don't need to say much, but the characters. The Six of Crows duology is the most character driven, I would say, in all of the three series that Lee made in the Grishaverse, and for good reason. You know, Kaz, Inej, Nina, Matthias, Jesper, and Wylan are the best characters I've ever read. Again, bold statement, but you know, I'm in the high, so let me be. My favorite, of course, is Nina because I resonate with her the most. I just love our homegirl. She's so confident in her body. She's so confident in her powers. She just loves her waffles and is in love with a feared man. And I'm just like, I'm all for it. Of course, Kaz Brecker. I talked about this with my friend Theola. Theola, if you're watching this, I love you. And we both said that Kaz is Lee Bardugo's greatest masterpiece. He is the greatest character she has ever written, personally. So complex, so layered, so vulnerable. Also so demonic and brutal and ruthless and a genius. Also so very sexy. And all the other crows are amazing. Inej. Inej, who can do no wrong, who is so strong with her faith, who is the knife wife, who is everything. And then we have Wylan, our demo boy. Amazing, adorable, beautiful, broken Wylan. Jesper, who is the light of our lives, will make us laugh, will make us cry dependable, conflicted, will run away with your money, Jesper Fahi, but we love him. And of course, Matthias. Matthias, our big blonde Zuko, as Lee Bardugo has said, um, who just loves Nina. I think I think his purpose in life is to just love Nina forever. And we love seeing this whole dynamic of six different children who are going through like adolescence and growth, but at the same time trauma and trying to save their country or like the Grisha, but you know, of course denying it because again, they're not noble and they're not heroes. Nobody tell them they're noble, nobody. They will have an identity crisis. The action, the mystery, the adventure, the geopolitics that happens here, beautiful. There's nothing I didn't like about the, the book. Maybe if I had to mention one, it would be chapter one, which is Juiced. Oh my god, Juiced, rest in peace, buddy. I would never want to be 
a first chapter character in a Lee Bardugo book or like a side character in a Lee Bardugo book that has suddenly has chapters because I guarantee you, you will die. Remember Isaac in King of Scars? Buddy. I remember memorizing his name because I was like, oh, this is the first crow. Juice is the first crow. He dies. Crooked Kingdom the best sequel I've ever read in my life. Probably the best book I've read in my life. It's hard for me to say if I like this or this more. I think it depends on my mood. If you ask me in like a really low day where I just need some adventure, it would probably be this. If I'm being emotional, it will probably be this because this made me cry more than I thought it should have. You know, because in Six of Crows, we're all about like death and, and blood and heists and adventure. But then here, you're just like pain, 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 pain. I loved every part of it. I love that we got more Wylan in this. Oh, I have to say, in Six of Crows, another thing I didn't like about it is um, we didn't get enough Wylan. We didn't get any Wylan chapters at all, but it made up for it in Crooked Kingdom because we got so much Wyland. We finally got the Wyland story that we deserved. He didn't deserve the backstory that he, he has, but it was beautiful. It was painful. You know what? It's like um, a battle of which crow has the worst backstory. And maybe that's something we don't like because we don't like our crows to go through a bad time because we love them and we will die for them and we, 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 we. This was everything. It was a perfect conclusion. One thing that maybe we did not like is of course, Matthias's death. Again, that messed me up. If you wanna see how much that messed me up, watch my other video. I will not cry today. But, um, you know, it's contentious. It's debatable. There can be a lot of arguments surrounding it. There are other deaths in the Grisha trilogy that I did not like more than me not liking Matthias's death. I think this has an explanation, um, no matter how painful it is, no matter how much we love him, especially for me because Helnick is my number one ship, but we love Truck and Kingdom. Okay, that was fast. Finally, we are on the final leg of this video, which um, comprises these two bad boys. We have the King of Scars duology. Let's talk about King of Scars. What do we like about this? First of all, I had zero clue as to what this book was going to be about. Unlike Shadow and Bone, who I kind of knew the story because of Six of Crows, and the plot is kind of, you know, predictable because there's an agenda. We know the mission. The mission is to take down the fold and to take down the Darkling. In Six of Crows, we have six kids who have to go on a heist. Um, they have to kidnap this person. They have to eradicate Jurda Parem. In Crooked Kingdom, they had to save Inej. They had to face Van Eck and all that. So there was a clear to-do list of you know, what was going to happen. It was just a, a matter of how they were going to execute or like face their conflicts. I had no clue where this was going. <laughs> this was a trip. I honestly felt high like 50% of the time I was rooting cricket capable, but in a, in a good way. You know, I was enjoying it. All the, all the cliffhangers, all the surprises, I was, floored and I enjoyed the revelations that were happening in each chapter because Lee is so good at you know chapter endings and revealing things. Second thing, the royal crew. I was buddy reading this with my friend Julia and we said that the Six of Crows crew is kind of your high school friend group or your high school barcada and <laughs> the King of Scars crew or the royal crew, we, we label them the royal crew, is your college friend group because you know, in high school, you're all about blowing things up and messing up and being depressed. But then in King of Scars, you're all about what is my purpose in life? What is good for my country? What will I do in the future? An existential crisis. I really love the dynamic of Nikolai and the triumvirate and the twins. So there's Zoya, Jenya, David, and then there's Tolia and Tamar and Tolia. <laughs> <sighs> Tolia, the love of my life. I finally found my bias in the Grishaverse because when I read books with ships, I fall in love with people, but you know, I don't claim them for myself. Like for example, Kaz, I'm so in love with a dude, but I want him for Inej, I don't want him for me. So it's rare to find someone who isn't shipped with anybody, and I know that Tolia wants to be a monk, but I think 
I genuinely think I can seduce the man and charm him out of his socks. Also, can we just talk about how Lee Bardugo just plucks out three of his loudest and boldest and most shameless characters and puts it in one book. Nina, Zoya, Nikolai. They're the most extroverted, shameless people in the books, which is why the banter was delicious. I feel like there were times where I was feeling like, my god, this is all too much. We're getting so much good dialogue that this feels like pure fan service. And I guess it was. I guess the King of Scars duology was just pure fan service for the fans. You can't read it alone. Like, you can't read it like how I read Six of Crows first before. Um, Shadow and Bone, you can't do that because you will not understand 80% of the plot if you don't know what's going on in the other books. Okay, let's talk about Isaac. First of all, I would bias him if he didn't die. He reminded me so much of Remus Lupin from Harry Potter. He just had that whole vibe, the quiet but really smart and was hiding like charm inside him. I was so in love with him. I was ready to marry him. But then he fell in love with Princess Eri or Mayu that we discover in the end is Mayu. Um, which is why his ending made me... We'll talk about that later. Last thing I liked about King of Scars um, is the Saints plot. I love the Saints plot. At first I thought I was I thought it was a joke. That whole experience with the, when they revealed that it was the saints when they when Nikolai and Zoya and Yuri were transported to that land in the shadow fold I felt like I was watching Thor Ragnarok you know how Thor Ragnarok made you feel high 70% of the time I felt that reading King of Scars because it was so trippy like the whole saints plot was so trippy but I loved it Juris I am officially a Juris stan. Um, I love Grigory as well. And I also love that little detail we got where we found out that the term Grisha actually was a play in the name Grigory. Um, I love that. I love that small detail. We hate Lizaveta. All I have to say about her is Inej would be so disappointed in her. Okay. Things we don't like about King of Scars, and I don't want to be cancelled again here. I did not like Hanina. This is coming from a hardcore Hellnick stand, by the way. So, okay, at the first part of the book, we see mm, Nina burying Matthias in Fierda, and it was a whole depressing chapter. I was bawling my eyes out. We were crying, we were grieving, we were hearing Matthias in Nina's head, and it was sad. But that scene where she rides in to save Nina from the wolf, which is actually Trassel, Matthias's wolf, that symbolism, and I don't know if anybody picked anybody else picked it up or that was the intention of Lee, but she rides in and drives Trassel away. Like she drives the symbol of Matthias out of the picture. And that crap hurt me. Like, wh what? We were just grieving, and then suddenly this girl comes and rides in, and then and then Nina sees her hair billowing in the wind, and suddenly is mesmerized by how shiny it is, and how luscious Hunt's lips are, and how long her limbs are. Like, come on, girl, you just buried your dead husband, and you're already... What? 80% of the time in Nina's head is her talking about how beautiful Han's hair is. And this persists in Rule of Wolves and that is something I did not like. It just felt like the establishment or the foundation of her relationship with Han was something purely physical and I didn't vibe with it. It was too fast. Like I know they didn't get together in King of Scars but the implications were already there so early in the book. The ending of Crooked Kingdom kind of implied that we would see Nina as an independent woman going to Fyrda to save Matthias's people and I was expecting that to be her drive. No, it didn't happen and I was just so upset. Nina's plot also felt really disconnected with the main story or like we don't even know what the main story is. Is it Nina's? Is it Zoya's and Nikolai's? Like they never really intersect ever. Nina is just mentioned in Zoya and Nikolai's point of view and vice versa but they never like we never see scenes of them together which I was expecting. I already mentioned this a while ago. Um, Isaac dying 
god I don't even know if it had to happen like I I haven't I did not want him to die I loved him I was already so attached makes you think does Lee just kill people off unnecessarily what is the purpose what is the I didn't like it but maybe because Isaac was a bias last thing we didn't love is I did not like the Darklings Resurrection. I'm really sorry, but this is very unoriginal. It was completely useless and it just makes me angry because, you know, like I said, the ending of Ruin and Rising ruined me and this just makes all of Alina's sacrifice look so useless. Like she lost her powers just for the Darkling to resurrect. I mean, wh what? And there, that's King of Scars. Um, we are jumping straight to Rule of Wolves, the big, the bad, the painful. Let's talk about what we love. First, right off the bat, Zoya Lai. Zoya and Nikolai are, you know, <laughs> these two are just so delicious and so sexy. And I love how it started off with a general and king relationship. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good! But the ending is just so delicious. Nikolai surrendering the crown to Zoya at the end was so beautiful. Again, this is contentious because I agree that for most parts of this duology, we always hear and read about Nikolai loving Ravka. Um, it's his first love. He wasn't born to be king, but his love for the nation is just so strong. He will die for it. He's just the king that we all want but he also knows in his heart that Ravka cannot survive with a lance of line anymore so that level of sacrifice that he did at the end to surrender the crown to Zoya to someone he loves man where can I get a man Zoya's dragon arc I loved that Zoya was able to um, gain that sort of power but that whole arc, her transforming into a dragon, um, and Zoya's little- oh my god. I, I, I keep telling my friends that Zoya is that Asian tiger mom we didn't know we needed. She is so maternal, she doesn't even realize it. She has a vegetable garden for her dead Grisha friends, and she just grows plants for each friend. And in the last part, she was just whole mom mode on Nina, and I was loving it. I saw Zoya in a completely different light in this duology. We love her. We will die for her. I am not worthy to be in her presence. Okay, number three, Queen Maki. Queen Maki, this bitch, what? When I read the first chapter of Rule of Wolves, which is Queen Maki's chapter, we find out that it was not actually her who should be queen of the shoe. Also, by the way, also before, okay, before we talk about Queen Maki, can we talk about the fact, page 210, the Taban queens didn't take husbands, but had multiple male consorts. So no man could claim any child as his, nor make any bid for the throne. Oh! Excuse me! So do you mean the Shuhan is run by women? This is when I declared Shuhan to be my favorite country. I wanted to be Shu, and I think the perfect way to be Shu is to marry Tolia Yulbatar. Anyway, going back to powerful queens, we have Queen Maki, who, when her mom died, stole the throne from her sister because it wasn't supposed to be her. It was supposed to be Princess Eri. Her mom was like, it's Eri, not you, because you're too arrogant. I'm so sorry, daughter. But daughter was like, <laughs> you're gonna die anyway, mother, and you won't be here to see who the next queen is, so let me take it for myself because nobody else knows anyway. <gasps> This is what I mean when I say you don't need the Darkling in this story because you have Fyrda and Jarl Brum who is terrible and then you have Queen Maki who is the baddest woman ever. Hello? You know, there could have been a Zoya and Maki showdown, a Nina and Jarl showdown. Of course, we have to mention the Six of Crows cameo that felt like pure fan service, but I was eating it up. As I remember when we finally entered Ketterdam and we were back in Kerch and walking through the west and east stave and going in the barrel and seeing Kaz Brecker's large dramatic ass 
Crow Club that grew like three times the size it was before and we meet Kaz and Jesper and Wyland. Jesper and Wyland agreeing to commit crime for Inej? Yes! We all love Sancta Inej and we will do everything for her. Also, can I just say, Kaz Brecker delivered the best line in this entire book. Kaz, this is the problem with letting your enemies live. They're my parents, said Nikolai. Your point? Kaz settled his cane more firmly in his grip and nodded to the cable operator ready to descend. A word of advice? From one bastard to another, sometimes it's best to let the demon have its day. How could Kaz Brecker steal the show? How? He's the biggest upstager ever. I can't believe he got the best line in the entire book. Last, 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 last. Magnus Opter. Oh my god, this man. This whole chapter is probably one of my favorite chapters in the books, if not my favorite chapter already. When Magnus got to meet Nikolai, finally, when he escaped from Fjorda and he went straight to Nikolai and he said that he would disappear, but that he wanted to see his son from one last time because he was selfish and that he would never um, rat him out because he wanted a good life for his son and he wanted his son to be successful. <laughs> Oh my God. Like, we know how much of a terrible woman Nikolai's mom is, but then when we see Magnus, we just finally see where Nikolai gets all his charm and his brains and his noble heart, and you're just like... <laughs> I said I wouldn't cry in this video. They're both so dramatic and they're both so handsome and good. That was so... I can't. Let's move on. Since I have tears in my eyes, I think it is fitting to begin my dislikes with the number one dislike of all dislikes, David Steff. If it was meant to trigger Zoya or like, I don't know, light a fire inside her and Nikolai, it was not necessary. Genya didn't even get a chapter. This is when Leigh Bardugo gets her title of Queen of Unnecessary Deaths because this was the most unnecessary deaths of all the deaths in all her books. Oh my god, like there was a scene, like the ending chapter at the first part was like, David is missing. And then in chapter 20, we just find out that they were burning his body and it was already the funeral and we didn't even get like the whole scoop of how he died. Yeah, he was buried in the rubble, but we we glazed over that. And my God, David deserves better. He's such a wonderful character. Like Lee Bardugo, do you not love your characters? Like, do you hate them that much that he, that he, he deserves this death? And hasn't Genya gone through enough? Why does Lee hate her? Honestly, she didn't get a chapter in this whole, like, duology. She was sold by the Darkling to the king and was taken advantage of and had the worst experience ever. And then she was scarred by the Darkling, tortured and punished. And then you kill her husband while he's still in his wedding clothes on their wedding day. I think a classic Lee Bardugo death clue would be if there are two characters who are having too much screen time and you're seeing them so happy all the time. Because in King of Scars and at the start of Rule of Wolves, you can see that we had so much Genya and David moment. So much. And this was the exact same situation we had going on in Crooked Kingdom. There were so many Matthias and Nina scenes that when it built up to that point, we were just broken. We were gone, we wanted to jump out of a window. It was not fun, bestie. Next, um, and you already know where I'm going with this because I already mentioned it for King of Scars, but again, our homegirl Nina. I don't know, she seemed like an entirely different character in this duology, and I don't want to kind of discredit any kind of growth that Lee tried to write for Nina. But none of it just made any sense. First of all, her powers weren't utilized. She can summon the dead, but all she did with her powers in Rule of Wolves was to listen to dead people gossip. She can summon the freaking dead! That that chapter in King of Scars where she summoned like the army of the dead was so good. Like where was that in Rule of Wolves? Like we didn't see much of her power at all. And I know she was a spy for Ravka and she had to act all meek and submissive as you know Mila, Yanderstrat, Janderstrat, whatever. But I just didn't like how we didn't see Nina and her full potential. And again, it was 
everything was about Han. It was Han this, Han that. She was making decisions based on this girl that she just met. And why on earth did Lee Bardugo give her a feared and fetish? Like she's falling for all these feared and people and I'm just like why? She's more than just being a love interest. One of your strongest characters in the entire Grishaverse. You again reduce to being a love interest. And I really hope this wasn't Lee's intention at all but this is what it looked like to me. We all know that uh, Nina is bisexual from Crooked Kingdom, but to me, you don't need to emphasize someone's bisexuality by giving her a love interest. You don't need to represent that part of her by giving her some sort of romantic arc. Like, that's not what bisexuality, that's not all what bisexuality is. This whole relationship that could have been something, like there was so much potential between Han and Nina, that we could have seen like grow as from friendship to you know potential lovers and we could have seen like an open ending again we with my open endings but like a kind of hint to it at the end of rule of wolves that would have been more preferential for me because right off the bat in king of scars again i say this she was already like infatuated with how Han looked and how you know Han's physical appearances which is why it makes me think that everything she likes about Han is you know you know physical and now um what could have been a relationship that blossomed with time was reduced to like this fast and shallow um relationship. Han didn't deserve any of that, you know, being used. Nina lied to her multiple times and used her. Both of them deserved so much better from each other. <laughs> Second to the last thing, um, I mentioned this in King of Scars, but again, the Darkling Resurrection. Completely unnecessary. We did not need him. And the way he was written, he's no longer the man, the myth, the legend, the Darkling, you know? He was this whole other different person that was petty and shallow and I don't know, man. I did not like the way he was written here. And I know he had like some Yuri inside him because he was in Yuri's body. But as the Darkling, I'm like, what was the, what were those chapters? And that ending where they trapped him in a tree to hold like two worlds together for all eternity in pain. I mean, we find out eventually that there's this, I don't know, item from Sanct Felix that can possibly replace the Darkling. Like this is the whole end of Rule of Wolves where Zoya calls out to Kaz to kind of look for that thing. So if we have that option, we didn't need the Darkling all along, right? Can we also mention the fact that Yuri is still there? So Lee subjected this innocent teenager. I mean, Yuri had his faults, but he is a teenager who made mistakes and worshiped the wrong saint. But does he deserve to live like in eternal pain inside that tree with a Darkling? Honey, honey, there we have it. There we have our Rule of Wolves rant and our Grishaverse discussion. Woo! Guys, I've been filming this for five hours. I hope you're still here with me. If you are, thank you very much. Before we end this video, I guess is what you've all been here for. Let's rank the Grishaverse books. Okay. For the first spot, of course, it will be any of these two. And I just have to say, they are equally equal in my heart. This is just basically one story for me, honestly. But if I had to choose, it again, it would be depending on my mood. So I think now I'm feeling all emotional because we're, you know, talking about the whole universe and how beautiful and wonderful it is. So I'm gonna go with number one spot, Crooked Kingdom. In different days, in different moods, Six of Crows would be my first. But uh, today, Six of Crows is my second. So this is my number one. Number two, Six of Crows. Number three would be, and I thought about this real hard, but it has to be King of Scars. I love this book, honestly. It surprised me in so many ways. The revelations I really loved because I didn't know what was going on, so I didn't know what to expect. I loved it. Delicious. The politics, everything, the characters, wonderful. And then we have at number four, even if it destroyed me, it um, caused me so much pain. At the same time, it gave me joy and Zoya Lai <laughs> and um, Tolia and Tamar and Jenya and David and everyone. 
but yeah, Rule of Wolves, number four. Um, this is a 50-50 for me. I still haven't rated this in on Goodreads. I don't know if it's like a 3.75 or a 4 or a 3, but I really love this book. I love, hate it, and it will, yeah, it's number four. And of course, the bottom three will be the Grisha Trilogy, and obviously, um, the fifth book would be Siege and Storm, my favorite book of the three. It was the most action-packed, uh, plot-heavy, and we saw a lot of character development and a lot of conflict, and yeah. So this is my one, two, three, four, fifth. <laughs> and here we have my bottom two. Um, this was not hard, and I don't know if you can guess it right, but uh, my sixth will have to be something that I hate lesser than the other one, which is Shadow and Bone. As much as this was a meh book to me, I didn't hate it. You know, I loved it still. I really enjoyed it. Again, like I said, I would have loved it even more if I read this earlier in my life, if I were younger. I came from Six of Crows and then this one. So I guess that was a big factor. And the book that ruined me the most, <laughs> and not in a good way, Ruin and Rising, my last. There we have it, guys. This is my official ranking um, from my most favorite to my least favorite. Uh, Grisha vs. Book. I am so curious as to what your rankings are. Please let me know. Uh, yeah, this was, this was it. My entire 2021 um, first quarter at least has been all about the Grisha verse and I'm so happy to be here I'm so happy to be in this fandom and I don't know. I think at this age um, We're more like, you know, I don't know me as a person is more capable to Indulge but at the same time be critical and you know point out things We don't like about something that we love and we can love things but also be critical about them at the same time is what I'm trying to say. And this is me with a whole Grisha verse journey. I loved it. It was amazing. There were parts where I did not <laughs> love it, but all in all, um, I will be bringing this to my grave. <laughs> yeah. This goes to say that Lee Bardugo has to pay for all the therapy I need and all the emotional damages have to be paid for as well. And that is it for this video, guys. Oh my God, we made it to the end. We're still alive. We're still, I hope you've had your coffee. Thank you so much for swimming by my channel. If you're still here, I am so grateful for you. So yes, I hope you have a wonderful morning, night, afternoon, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.